This program is brought to you by First National Bank of Botswana. FNB, how can we help you? Good evening and welcome to First Issues. At the time of recording this episode, the economies of the entire world were at a pause, all because of coronavirus. The virus has stopped everything, stopped shopping malls, the cruises, the gatherings, the travel, everything has been brought to a halt. In this midst of an economic standstill, over 2.5 million people have been infected by COVID-19. Over 170,000 have died and about 700,000 have recovered, according to free reference website worldometers.com. With all these, one sector has been sent into overdrive, the health sector with health professionals working long hours and under very difficult circumstances to save lives. In our program tonight, we discuss the possible psychological effects of COVID-19 on the frontline healthcare staff with Lily Reni, a life coach and a human resource specialist. You are watching First Issues, brought to you by First National Bank of Botswana. What are the possible effects of COVID-19 on the frontline healthcare staff and what possible interventions need to be made available to them? These are some of the questions we asked our guest tonight, Lily Remy, who joins us from Pretoria. There is a lot of things that we are uncertain of at this point, um, just because we don't have data to support any studies yet. Um, so no studies, limited studies have been done so far as to the effect of this COVID-19 virus on our healthcare professionals. Uh, but there are a couple of things that we do know. And one of these things uh, is that they will be feeling a huge amount of un um, uncertainty as the crisis um, becomes real. Um, so even before the crisis hits, they will be sitting with the uncertainty of how this thing will play out, what the effect will be on them and on their loved ones. Will uh, they be maybe will they transmit this virus to their families? Um, will it then be their fault if their family gets ill? Um, all of these personal issues will start coming up for them, which will drive emotions like anxiety, fear, um, helplessness, um, even anger. So these are the things that healthcare workers will have to be mindful of even before the crisis hits. Some of the other things that might start coming up is fear that they won't have the protective gear that is needed to protect themselves when they do their work every day. We know that worldwide there's, there's been a shortage of this um, personal protective gear that they need to wear. And um, in many cases, healthcare workers had to make do with um, whatever was available to them to help protect themselves in some way or form. Um, so there's also been a lot of news about this virus worldwide and the effect that it's had. There's horror stories about what's already played out in other hospitals and the healthcare workers will be very mindful of this even before they enter the crisis themselves. So this will leave them in a position where they are already feeling the psychological effect of this and the fear and anxiety that comes up um, before they deal with this, with this crisis themselves. Then when the crisis hits, there will be other things that comes up. One of these will be people suffering and dying um, around them. There were, there's been a UK study done um, that showed that about 48% of patients admitted with this virus died and up to 66% of patients who received advanced respiratory um, support 
died because of the virus. Um, this was done at an intensive care national audit and research center in the UK. So we have those figures that show us that there's a huge amount of people, especially the ones that go onto respiratory um, devices that, that die from this disease. Um, we also have uh, wired that have posted that um, a, you, uh, a, a, a nurse in New York City uh, Center saying that after almost every shift now, I go home, I break down into tears from all the stress I felt during the day, all hitting me at once. So we see here that people feel that they're working in a dangerous environment. Um, when the crisis really hits, there's exhaustion, there's being overworked, there's too little staff to deal with the crisis. And all of this comes to a head when they go home at night and they, 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 they the whole day hit them like a ton of bricks. Um, part of the reason for that is because they heavily focus on everything that needs to be done every day and they don't necessarily take the time to care for themselves as they should. They, they, they don't have the time to, to look after themselves. But like we know when we get into an aeroplane, the first thing that they tell us is that if there's a loss of uh, carbon, carbon pressure, what you do is you pull the mask towards yourself, you put the, the mask on yourself to be able to breathe um, oxygen, and then you start helping the people around you. And that is something that is crucial for healthcare workers and their employees to be aware of at this time, is that these people need to be aware of what is it that comes up for them in terms of their needs and to assist themselves first before trying to help others. Firstly, as CEO of FNB Botswana, I'd like to thank everybody who has been involved in the fight against COVID-19. I'd like to thank members of the FNB Botswana Board, members of the FNB Botswana Foundation Trust. I'd like to thank management, staff of FNB, as well as our customers who have responded positively to calls by government to assist. I'd also like to thank members of the public who are on the front line assisting fellow Botswana to adhere to the protocols announced by government on lockdown, as well as members of the public um, in the various professions such as nurses and others who are involved in assisting the public with various necessities. We asked Lily what sort of support needs to be put in place or interventions need to be made available to this team of professionals. One of the ways that we can try and assist these people is through uh, trauma debriefing sessions where they, can, they have a, a place where they can come and talk about the experiences that they've had and the trauma that they've experienced on a daily, ba on a daily basis. This is very important. Um, what will follow that is trauma counseling, where all the all the different things that trigger that could be that could be triggering them in the future, um, because of what they've experienced, will be dealt with. So these are some of the things that we can do that we can put in place to help these people to assist themselves first. Um, something else that comes to mind is assistance in a group format even, where there's a couple of people that go through similar um, situations and they can actually share with one another what it is that's come up for them, what they've experienced, what they've been thinking and feeling, and they can feel that they are not alone in this, but that there are others that is going through the same thing and collectively they can come up with solutions, um, they can share ideas and they can brainstorm suggestions of how to make this easier on everybody. So those are some of the things that 
could happen and should happen in a time like this because the psychological effect we've been looking a lot at the what people need physically in order to do their work but they also need the right frame of mind to pitch up every day and do the best they can with what they have. What are the possible signs that a family member or fellow colleagues should be on the lookout for that show that an individual is not coping with the situation at hand or needs immediate attention? Something that we can do to really assist our healthcare workers if they are our loved ones um, is to understand the signs and symptoms of when they really do need help. So I'm going to just share a couple of things with you that we can look out for. Firstly, on a psychological level, um, you'd be looking at shock, denial and disbelief as a warning sign. And that might play out as um, you ask the person whether they had a good day or what's been happening for them and they just deny that there's anything wrong, everything is always fine, um, they don't really engage in really answering the question, they just want to forget about it basically. So that is the first thing. Um, the second thing that we need to look out for is confusion, confusion or diff difficulty concentrating. Um, you might be talking to them and they might be a thousand miles away as you're talking to them and you have to bring them back constantly to the conversation. So that's something to look out for. Um, also anger, irrit irritability and mood swings. So we need to look out for our people, the change in personality. When someone that's always pleasant and kind all of a sudden is irritated and moody, then we know there's something wrong. So we, we know our people um, and when the, the, their personality change quite significantly, that is a warning sign. Um, something else is withdrawing from others. We find that People who are traumatized, they want to withdraw, stay in their room, stay in their bed. Um, they don't want to communicate. They find it difficult picking up the phone and talking to anybody. Um, so when you find someone constantly withdrawing into their own little world, into their own space, that's also a warning sign. Something else to look out for um, is a feeling of disconnection and feeling numb. Um, and this plays out as they don't feel like anything. Um, nothing brings them joy. Nothing really matters. Um, you would bring up a subject and they don't have any opinions. They sort of just apathetic. Um, that kind of numbness is also a, a danger sign. Now, on the physical side, we see that insomnia and nightmares is one of the big things that play out for people that are traumatized. And it's a warning sign to say that this, this person needs help. Also, um, feeling fatigued, uh, being startled easily, uh, difficulty concentrating, edginess and agitation, and also aches and pains in the body when you've got sore muscles, um, the neck and shoulders are constantly stiff. Um, all of these things are warning signs to help us understand that this person is not dealing with what they are experiencing um, in the best way and that they might need assistance. As FNB, we have decided to heed the government's call for assistance. We have decided to divide our assistance into two, financial and logistical. We, have we are announcing today that we will be assisting government by contributing a total sum of 10 million uh, towards assistance uh, for the challenges that we are faced with under COVID-19. That assistance is going to be broken down into two. Uh, first 5 million will be contributed directly to a fund that has been established by government. And the second 5 million will be used under the guidance of the FNB Botswana trustees for various activities aligned to 
the mandate of the FNB Botswana Foundation.